Hello, everybody. This week, we will be talking about the Rosaceae family. So you may already be a little familiar with the Rosaceae family um, because it includes a lot of common fruits you all probably likely eat, um, and of course, roses. And so it consists of also apples and strawberries and other um, plants. And they can generally be herbaceous or woody. And oftentimes, they do um, occur as shrubs and trees. However, some, of course, are forbs, like strawberries. Oftentimes, Rosaceae families have stipules um, at the base of each leaf along the stem. And a stipule is essentially a small leaf-like appendage, um, which is typically uh, comes in pairs at the base of the leaf stalk or where the petiole typically meets the stem on a plant. And so you can see where it's pointing here on um, on this rose plant, but it's kind of hard to see on this diagram. So here are also a couple other examples of, stipu of stipules um, for common vetch and also a spiny type of stipule, um, which is a modified stipule. And stipules generally are modified leaves. It typically plants in the Rosaceae family have five sepals and five petals, which are free, not fused, so they're not they're all separate from each other. And sepals, if you're not familiar with them, they're essentially these kind of, uh, again, modified leaves at the base of the flowers where the flowers come out of the stem. And then we also have a hypanthium, which is essentially a cup-like structure composed from the fused bases of the petals, sepals, and the stamen. Um, and so you can see an example of the hypanthium right here in label SC. And uh, usually uh, there's a lot of stamens in Rosaceae plants. So oftentimes plants in the Rosaceae family have variable fruit types, which might consist of pome fruits, which are those that have a central core containing multiple small seeds, like an apple, which is enveloped by a tough membrane and surrounded by an edible layer of flesh. And then there's also a droop or a dehiscent type of fruit in which the outer fleshy layer surrounds a single shell of the hardened um, endocarp or ovary um, and the seeds form inside. And these fruits usually kind of, again, form a plants with kind of superior ovaries. There's also uh, seeds uh, through dry capsules, kind of like what you can see here with uh, Rosa californica and how it makes rose hips. And also there are nutlets, which are another type of fruit type. And then their stems also have what we call uh, lenticles, which are often quite prominent. And lenticles essentially are um, pores on the stem or woody portions of the plant, which are often raised and allow for gas exchange within the stem sites, kind of similarly to how stomata allow for gas exchange at the leaves. And then also, they're really important. It's a really important family um, for human food consumption and human food chains. And uh, one note is this is the Rosaceae family. Previously, we were talking about tribes in the Poaceae family, but uh, now we're just going to be talking more broadly about plant families as we get into shrubs and forbs. And so there's not going to be any discussion on tribes. So the first plant we're going to talk about in the Rosaceae family is going to be serviceberry or Amelanchia alinifolia, also known as Saskatoon, and also many other um, common names. It has prominent white flowers with five sepals. And again, sepals are kind of this, these things kind of at the base of the flowers. Um, and so here you can see these sepals on the surface area, surface berry, um, whereas these are um, petals. And it also has five petals. And there are numerous stamens, as you can see in the photo. And its specific epithet, Alnifolia, for the species name, um, means alder-like leaves. So Almalanchia alnifolia, or Servisperia, is a perennial native and it's a cool season plant. And typically it grows as a shrub or a small tree. Here you really could usually consider this a shrub, um, less than six meters um, tall. And oftentimes it has single or clustered trunks at the branch. Oh, sorry, with branches near the base. And the fruits and inflorescences um, are received and they have terminal, they're terminal on new growth and um, two to 20 flower. 
And so that means um, the flowers uh, occur at the end of where new growth occurs. And the fruits are berry-like, and often they're reddish to black. And um, vegetatively, the leaves are alternate, simple. It has um, apex truncate leaves, um, which are rounded or obtuse, and the margins of the leaves are often serrate. And as you can see kind of here in our photo, the serrateness of the leaves. So Almolanker alnifolia, historically, was used, the fruits were used to make jams and other types of foods, and the stems were used to make arrow shafts and teepee stakes. And in terms of forage, um, young growth is often fair to good for livestock, and oftentimes it's considered excellent browse for deer and moose. Um, fruits can also be important for small mammals and bears, as well as birds. Um, and habitat-wise, it often occurs on brushy hillsides or open woods, canyons, and in creek beds. And typically, it prefers well-drained soils, although um, it does occasionally occur around bogs. And so here's a photo of Alma service service berry out in the field. Next up, we have true birch leaf mahog mountain mahogany, or true mountain mahogany, Cerocarpus montanus. Um, and this can be found on page 406. And here you can see in the photos, the leaves are, um, the leaf margins are often coarsely serrate and uh, the veins are straight. True mountain mahogany or Cerocarpus montanus um, is a perennial native species and it's also a cool season plant. And in terms of its growth, it often grows as a shrub or a small tree, less than six meters tall, and it often has a lot of branches, and the branches are often going upright, or they could be spreading. Um, in terms of its flowering and phenology, it often flowers in June to July. And for its flowers, it's usually grouped in groups of two to three, um, but sometimes grouped in five to 15 on short spur-like branches. Um, the styles are often persistent, even after pollination, and often they can be plumose. And um, oftentimes it kind of, uh, in terms of its fruit, it, it kind of looks like it has a tail, and that's why we call it Cerocarpus, because Cero um, means tail in Latin, and carpus is fruit. Vegetatively speaking, the leaves are also alternate, and um, if you're not familiar with the term alternate, that means leaves are kind of alternating on the sides of the stem and not directly opposite from each other. And they are simple leaves. They're also um, apex acute to rounded or acute. And um, uh, margins, again, are coarsely serrate. And there are often three to 10 veins, which are often very straight um, with entering the teeth of the serration you see on the leaf as we can kind of um, see in this image right here. So historically, Cerocarpus montanus um, was used by indigenous tribes and Native Americans to, um, for wood to make tools, and its reddish bark um, was used by the certain tribes to also dye leather. In terms of forage, it's often considered good for cattle and sheep and goat and um, often is also valuable winter browse for deer and elk and uh, bighorn sheep and other wildlife. Habitat wise, it often occurs on rocky bluffs, on mountainsides, canyons and rim rocks, and, and sometimes in open woodlands. And it's often very abundant in dry soils. And so here's a kind of a photo of that Cerocarpus that we're talking about that kind of looks like a tail and it's uh, Plumos. So next we're going to be talking about choke cherry, Pernus virginiana, found on page 415. And it often has droop dark red to black lustrous um, fruits. And so lustrous means it's somewhat shiny in the sun, as you can kind of see in this photo. And a droop fruit, again, is kind of one with a center pith, like a peach. Or in this case, it might look like grapes, but it's actually closer to a cherry. Um, like the name, choke cherry. Um, and then its racemes has many flowers 
And if you're unfamiliar with the term racemes, it's essentially a cluster of flowers with many equidistant um, with flowers that have little mini stems that come off of that kind of larger stem or the raceme that are about equidistant um, or also pedicelled um, equidistantly. And so raceme flower is a flower cluster with many flowers that come off of many equidistant stems, kind of like the one we see right here. So choke cherry or Prudus virginiana is a, another perennial native species and it's also a cool, cool season plant. In terms of its growth, again, another shrub or small tree. Um, however, it can get a little taller. Usually it's less than 10 meters tall though. And oftentimes it can also be rhizominous and form really dense, thick thickets of um, Prunus virginiana specifically. And oftentimes it will flower between April to July. And the term, in terms of its fruits and flowers, the flowers are often um, very showy, as we can see in the photo above me. And it also has five petals, five sepals, and many stamens, characteristic of the Rosaceae family. Oftentimes they're arranged in drooping racemes. And the berries are also dark red um, to black and often lustrous or shiny. And vegetatively speaking, the leaves are alternate. And again, that means they occur right opposite of each other, but not in line when they're kind of alternating on the side of the stems. And uh, the leaves are relatively simple and the blades are elliptic shaped. And the bigger leaves may have some very fine serration as we can kind of see in the image above me. And then I can get my laser working. And here we can see that fine serration. Prunus virginiana or choke cherry um, also has historic uses for jelly. And uh, the bark was used as a flavoring agent for cough syrup. And indigenous tribes used the bark oftentimes um, to try to cure diarrhea and also to um, and use the fruit to treat canker sores. Um, and added it to pemmican. The wood was often used for arrows, bull, bow, bows, sorry, and pipe stems, and it also can be used ornamentally these days. In terms of its forage, though, it's often um, not that great for cattle and sheep, and it often has toxicity and can be poisonous to these types of livestock. Um, but the twigs, do make good winter forage for wildlife that can kind of handle the secondary chemicals this plant produces. Uh, the fruits are also important for wildlife. In terms of its habitat, it typically occurs in prairies, hillsides, and canyons, and it all often occurs on abundantly on moist soils, but it can occupy a broad range of soil types. It can also, because it's toxic, cause livestock losses, um, and that's because many of the leaves, stems, and seeds can contain high levels of hydrocyanic acid. And um, these hydrocyanic acid compounds often uh, become more prominent or concentrated after stresses like drought and freezing. And so um, this plant, choke cherry, Prunus virginiana, has very prominent lenticles, which are often whitish color, um, which contrast kind of with the color of the bark, as we can kind of see um, kind of all up and down this stem here. Next, we have antelope bitter brush or Persiana tridentata, which can be found on page 419 of your book. And the specific epithet tridentata or the species name specifically refers to the three lobes on the tip of the leaves. And so you can kind of see that here. Um, and then the leaves often appeared uh, fascicled on many short spurred like branches. So antelope bitter brush or Persiana tridentata is an evergreen plant, which is also another perennial native. Uh, it's also a woody plant, which is considered a shrub that often grows up to three meters tall. And it's like I mentioned, an evergreen plant that has many branches, but sometimes they can be late deciduous and drop some leaves late in the season, depending on how the climate is that year. Usually it will flower between April to August. 
It has a very classic rose flower family with again five sepals, five petals, and many stamens, and persistent, in this case, persistent styles after pollination. Uh, the flowers tend to be a vibrant yellow color. Vegetatively speaking, the leaves are a baxily, densely white woolly, and a baxily, again, you forget what that meant, that's the underside or the backside of the leaves, a back, back, um, and here's that kind of dense white woolly that we're talking about. And the, the leaves also tend to be fascicled. I forgot to mention that on the last, I, I forgot to explain what that was in the last slide, but that means they're bundled in groups along the stem. So you can see here, there are three sets of leaves um, fascicled and coming out of this one group along the stem. And this is kind of similar to like how pine needles are fascicled, which some of you may be more familiar with as uh, maybe students as Humboldt County. Um, and then the leaves are often apex of three lobed, or sorry, they're apex of three lobed to tridentate. And so again, we can see the, the three lobes in this photo above me. Um, let me get my pointer. Here we go, three lobes. And they can be more tridentate also, which means these lobes might be a little bit more narrow and pointed. It's a little bitter brush or Persiana tridentata historically um, has been used as an ornamental plant in some places by some people. Um, and in terms of its forage, it's typically considered good forage for all livestock classes, especially in the fall and winter. Um, but it is usually not eaten by horses. So that could be an important consideration. Um, and in terms of livestock, it's often considered excellent forage especially for mule deer, pronghorn, and white-tailed uh, deer, as well as elk. The seeds can be really important for small mammals as well as bird species. And in terms of its habitat, it typically occurs on plains, foothills, and mountain slopes, and is typically abundant on well-drained, sandy, or gravelly, or rocky soils. So to end off, our presentation, here is a nice photo of Persiana tridentata, um, and you can kind of see leaves and some flowers and how they're arranged on the branches, um, which are many branched. And here we can kind of see an example of the fascicled leaves, all these three leaves, come, multiple leaves coming out of this one fascicle. And here we can see um, one of those kind of classic rose family flowers, um, also with the hypanthium which kind of the, with those fused bases of the stamens and, and, uh, and sepals. And with that, that's all for this week. Um, I hope you all have a great week and make sure you comment on your discussion post about what your favorite term from this lecture was. Thank you.